Viper or Solidity? Which smart contract language is better? In this video, we will look at popularity, developer experience, gas optimization, opcode use, and gas optimization to compare the languages. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and... We're gonna be comparing Viper and Solidity because they are by far the two most popular smart contract programming languages. Additionally, we're going to include Huff and Yule because they are lower level languages that are great to benchmark to. And you can't really fairly assess Solidity without including Yule. The language holy wars on Twitter has fueled a little bit of this debate, but spoiler alert, they're all fantastic languages. Additionally, these languages keep improving over time and in about a year, this video might be totally outdated. We'll find out. So let's start our smart contract gas smackdown. According to DeFi Llama, for total value locked, Solidity secures about 87% of all DeFi smart contracts. And then next is Viper at about 8%. Curve Finance being a big reason that Viper is up there. So if pure popularity is what you're looking for, you don't need to look farther than Solidity. Now for the next three sections, we're gonna compare a smart contract that does essentially the same things. It needs to have a private number at storage slot zero, have a function with the read number function signature that reads what's at storage slot zero and allows you to update that number with the store number function signature. And if you'd like to follow along with all the code here, we have a GitHub repo in the description with all the code that we're gonna go through. So here's what the four contracts look like. Solidity, Viper, Just by looking at these four contracts, we can feel the developer experience of writing in these languages. Just looking at the code, we can see that Solidity and Viper are substantially quicker to write because there's way less code here. This makes a lot of sense as these are higher level languages, while Yule and Huff are meant to be lower level language code. For that reason alone, it's so easy to see why Viper and Solidity have so much more adoption. Higher level languages are generally easier understood by humans with more abstraction underneath the hood, while lower level languages are the reverse of that. They're harder for humans to understand, but you can be more fine tuned with what you're doing. Now let's focus on the higher level languages for a second. And I promise we're about to get to gas optimization. I promise we're so close. You can clearly see Viper draws inspiration from Python and Solidity draws inspiration from JavaScript. So if you like Python, boom. If you like JavaScript, boom, there you go. Now let's talk developer experience tooling. I'm not gonna go into tooling too much because the tooling for the high level languages is really good. And the tooling for the lower level languages isn't as good, but still good enough. Solidity definitely comes as a first class citizen for most popular frameworks like Hardhat, Foundry, Remix, and Brownie. Viper can be added as a plugin to these, but comes as a first class citizen to Brownie, Apeworks, and Titanboa. Huff and Yule have a little bit less support, but with a Foundry plugin, you're good to go. All right, now let's talk gas. gas, gas. And specifically, we're gonna look at the three most important parts of a smart contract. The contract creation gas costs, the contract runtime gas costs, and then the metadata as well. Contract creation gas is how much it costs to deploy your smart contract. Runtime gas costs are how much it costs to interact and call functions in your contract. And then metadata is optional data appended to the end of your code. It'll contain things like language, version, et cetera. Now, before we actually deploy these and see the gas comparisons, we actually need to compile these contracts. Now, there's a lot of different flags we can use to compile them more gas efficiently or less gas efficiently. And I'm sure I'm gonna get a ton of comments because I already know some of the ways that I could have made these more gas efficient, but we've chosen just to go with some relatively popular settings for compiling your contracts. And if you wanna check out the GitHub repo associated with this, you can see those, or we will put them on the screen right here. And after we compile them, we can now deploy them and see how much gas they consume. Now you'll notice this fifth column here called Sol Yule. Solidity can be combined with the Yule programming language, which again is one of these lower level programming languages to make your Solidity go faster or be more performant. The idea here is that you get the high level advantages of Solidity while being able to tinker down with the EVM when you need to. As we can see, lower level languages like Huff and Yule are more gas efficient than Viper and Solidity, which makes sense because they're lower level. Viper seems to be a little bit more efficient than Solidity, and Huff and Yule seem to be both more efficient than both Viper and Solidity. Our sole Yule seems to be the worst by far, but we'll see why that normally isn't the case. Now, before we understand any of these differences of the contract creation code, let's look at the runtime differences. Remember, we're gonna be storing a number and reading a number from our contracts, and here are those results. We didn't have data for Yule because I didn't feel like making a Yule Foundry plugin, but I'm sure the gas costs there are gonna be similar to that of Huff. Keep in mind, the gas costs here are running a whole testing function, that's why the number seems so much higher than it probably actually is. But we can still see there's a major difference in gas between these languages. Okay, so let's go back to the contract creation. So now we have a good idea of approximately what we're working with here. Now, I gotta warn you, we are about to get really nerdy, like 
really nerdy. And for this section, it's good to have some understanding of how EVM opcodes work. So I've left a link in the description to the Open Zeppelin deconstructing a Solidity smart contract, which will give you a really good idea of how these contracts work and a lot of the opcodes associated with them. Because yes, we're going into opcodes now. So feel free to pause and take a look at that now. Again, remember, when you compile a smart contract, it's typically split up into the contract creation code, the actual runtime code, and then optional metadata, and then constructor arguments, but we're not gonna go into that. Now brace your eyes, because here come the opcodes. In your compiled bytecode, you can typically find the three different sections, creation code, runtime code, and metadata, data by looking at your bytecode and looking to see what sections are unreachable. This can be a little tricky, but typically looking for return opcodes, the F3 binary, is a good place to start. You can also look for opcodes like 39, which is the code copy opcode, which copies your contract onto the blockchain. And instead of looking directly at the binary, usually it's easier to look at the opcodes instead. Most compilers have an option to output the opcodes instead of just the binary. The Solidity compiler does something really nice for organization and adds an invalid opcode between these three sections to make them real easy to locate. Section A is our contract creation code, section B is our runtime code, and section C is our metadata. So for our contract creation gas comparisons, we wanna focus on our sections A. Now here is the full binary of the contract creation code for all of these contracts. That's it. It's only a few opcodes that make up the contract creation bytecode. We aren't going to go over what every opcode and every piece of binary is doing here, but in the article associated with this video, again, in the description, we go over that for you if you're interested. Instead, in this video, we're just gonna focus on what each language is doing differently to make for these gas differences. Now for contract creation, Huff, Viper, and Yule do pretty much nearly exactly the same thing. This list of seven opcodes just takes your code and sticks it on chain, that's it. Now Solidity takes a slightly different route and even these opcodes still do approximately what the other languages do. You can still see the code copy opcode here as well. It's all this extra stuff at the beginning that makes the differences in gas. Solidity is doing the following extra work. It's creating a free memory pointer and then checking to see if you sent any ETH when deploying your contract. And remember, these little bits of extra work costs gas. Anything you do extra costs gas. We'll talk about the free memory pointer later. But one of these things that is fantastic is it is checking to see if we're sending ETH with our contract. This is advantageous so that we don't accidentally send some ETH that becomes unrecoverable. We don't lock ETH into our contract forever. Solidity is looking out for us. Interestingly, if you add a constructor to your Viper code and then recompile, you'll get an ETH check in the Viper binary as well. Viper and Solidity looking out for us devs. Now it's these additive checks that are looking out for us are typically what make Viper and Solidity more expensive than Huff and Yule. They're doing some extra work under the hood to look out for us and protect us from doing something stupid. Pop the hood? Pop the hood. Yule and Huff on the other hand are gonna say, hey, we're gonna do only what you tell us to do. We're not doing any checks unless you tell us to do some checks. And it's this extra free memory pointer which is why the Solidity code here is gonna be so much more gas expensive. The Viper code after the Solidity and Solidity Yule is gonna be the second most expensive because the Viper runtime code is just gonna be bigger because it also does a lot of checks that we're gonna see in a minute, while Huff and Yule are gonna be around the same. Now, let's talk runtime code. Remember, for the runtime code, we're measuring how much it costs to store and then how much it costs to read from our contract. And I was able to walk opcode by opcode through this by using foundry test dash dash debug and then my test function. It's really nice. I highly recommend you try it out. Let's start with Huff. And we'll just look at storing the number 77 by calling the store number function signature. Here are the opcodes for calling store number. The first thing that our contract does is it'll figure out what function to call based on the data that's sent. We send over data associated with the store number function. Then we store the data in the contract. Boom, that's it. Let's see what Viper and Solidity add on here. Viper is still doing those first two pieces that Huff does. Although it looks like we add three checks in here. We make sure we have enough data to call a function. We make sure we didn't send any ETH. And then we make sure we have enough data for a number. These checks make sure that users don't accidentally send some data to our contract that screws it up or locks money in our contract forever. It costs extra gas, but it makes us extra safe. Now let's see what the major difference in Solidity is. We can see Solidity does the same three checks, has that additional free memory pointer, and takes a slightly different route on how it sets up the contract and does the checks. So what are the main differences between these languages? Solidity has the free memory pointer. Viper and Solidity both do extra checks on ETH and data size, and they all have slight difference in which opcodes they use to do what. That last piece typically makes negligible gas differences, but it's interesting nonetheless. For example, Solidity uses is zero versus Viper uses X or, even though they kind of do the same thing, and it doesn't really make a difference. But okay, so what's, what's this free memory pointer? Why does Solidity have it, but not Yule, not Viper, and not Huff? And here's another one of the major differences between the languages, how they manipulate memory. Memory in the EVM is a 
big array that is alive for the duration of a function. Once the function ends, memory ends. And when you want to put something new into memory, the free memory pointer always points to the end of the memory. So you always know what index you can add memory to. If you want to add memory, check the free memory pointer, add your stuff to where it's pointing, and then update the pointer. This is great since there are data structures like dynamic arrays that we may have to load into memory and they won't be sure how much memory we need to allocate them. So we need a way to allocate dynamic amounts of memory. Viper does this a little differently. Viper doesn't allow for variables to be of unknown sizes. So it doesn't need a free memory pointer because it always knows exactly how much memory it's going to need to call a function. So instead, at runtime, Viper just allocates the spots where it needs and assigns everything to a position in memory. This is also why Viper doesn't get stacked to deep errors since it's using memory statically as opposed to dynamically. In Viper, there are no dynamic data structures. You are forced to say exactly how big your arrays and how big your objects are, which is why Viper can assign memory statically. Now, this might sound like an advantage and you'd be like, oh, well, why doesn't every language just do that? Let's look at an example of a trade-off. In Solidity, we can declare a dynamic array with no size constraint. We can always push more items to an array, and when we load the array into memory, our array could be of any size since the array is dynamic, and we need the free memory pointer to know where to put our memory. In Viper, you can have a dynamic array, but you must specify a maximum size. When you load an array into memory, Viper will always know exactly how much memory it needs, so it doesn't need the free memory pointer. This means that Viper can often be more gas efficient than Solidity when it comes to memory management. This can be seen as an advantage or a disadvantage depending on who you talk to. And remember, Huff and Yule don't do any of this, they just do exactly what you tell them to do. Speaking of Yule though, looking at my chart above, working with Solidity and Yule seems to be like the worst option, since at least the contract creation code is so much more expensive. However, we know from bigger projects that this isn't the case. One of the most popular projects that was written as a Solidity version and then as a Solidity and Yule version is the Seaport project. Project. And after a Git clone and a few tweaks, we can run our gas comparisons. On average, the function calls performed 25% better on the Solidity and Yule versions, and the contract creation performed about 40% better. That's a lot of gas. Wonder how much they could have saved in pure Yule. Wonder how much they could have saved with Viper. I wonder. And finally, the metadata. Viper and Solidity both append some extra data to the end of our contracts. It's small enough though, and it's only a one-time expenditure, so we're basically going to ignore it. And if you want to, you can chop it off anyways. Whew. Okay, we've gone through a lot here. So I know at the beginning I told you use whatever you want, but it's time for my official recommendation. And my official recommendation for the smart contract language that you should use is whatever you wanna use. But seriously, each one of these has their advantages and is worthwhile for production EVM code. And here are my final thoughts on all of this. If you're coding production smart contracts, use Viper or Solidity. They're both high level languages that will protect you from shooting yourself in the foot by looking at call data sizes and accidentally sending ETH and safe math. And they're just both great languages. So pick whichever one and have fun. Huff and Yule are fantastic languages if you need very specifically performant code or you're looking to learn more about the EVM. I don't recommend using these languages for all your production code. I do think though, they are fantastic to learn and understand. And then finally, understand the memory differences between Viper and Solidity. Again, one of the main differences in our gas costs is gonna be this free memory pointer. Keep this in mind when you get advanced and you're looking to understand more of the underlying differences between these tools. Whew, we have learned a lot here. I hope you did too. Now, these languages will continue to evolve and we'll likely continue to see more EVM languages pop up like Reach or Fay. Fee? Fay? Fi? I don't know how to pronounce it. And I'm willing to bet a lot of this video will might be outdated in a year because these teams are moving so fast building these amazing languages. So huge thank you to both Solidity and Viper teams for building these awesome languages and all the other teams working on fantastic EVM languages and all smart contract languages for that matter. And that's it. Hope you learned a lot. Let me know in the comment section if you learned anything or if you hated the way I compiled my contracts because I'm sure some of you did or if when you did some gas comparisons, you found something else. And we'll see you next time.